and welcome to Emma's ESL English. No, it's not Christmas yet. I was just really cold and this is quite a warm jumper, but we'll definitely be back in this uh, next month. <laughs> okay, so today <sighs> I wanted to talk about the stupidity of English. <laughs> Many of you will have noticed and have complained about the stupidity of English and especially English spelling. As one website said, the only rules of English spelling is that there aren't any rules, despite us giving you a whole bunch of rules. <laughs> There's pretty much exceptions to every one of them. So. so today I want to look at some of our weirdly spelled words and see if we can understand why they are spelled that way. One of the common rules that we were taught at school, that is me, <laughs> that I was taught at school, is that all English words must be made up with both consonants and vowels. And then one day you learn about poetry and about sonnets and about rhyme and rhythm. And perhaps if you're paying attention, you start to wonder about these rules the teachers keep telling you about. There are quite a few English words that use Y in the middle. In most of them, the Y makes an I sound. And quite often, just like with rhythm, there are no vowels in the words at all. Other examples include gym, gypsy, crypt, sink. So what is going on here? It turns out that this Y comes from Greek. The problem was that some Greek words didn't work in Latin because Latin didn't have this Y sound, which didn't sound like Y or I at the time. Because Latin was used all over the Roman world, this letter was introduced in many countries. And so many countries have this Y in their vocabulary. In England, the sound evolved and became similar to an I. Whereas in Finland and some other countries, it kept its original sound. And this change in English goes back a long way. It is identified even as far back as 1066. But of course, it's not so simple. Taking rhyme and rhythm as our main examples, we can learn about the impact of the printing press. Although these two words did used to be spelled like the rhyme in French, which is R-I-M-E, which is much easier and more sensible, <laughs> in the 16th and 17th centuries, the printing press was brought into the UK and became very, very well used across the UK. Some of the people using the printing press to write leaflets and books, they knew their Latin and they knew that the root of this word rhyme that they were currently spelling R-I-M-E, they knew that the root of that word was Latin and that it came from the word rhythmus, spelt R-H-Y-T-H-M-U-S. So they started changing the spelling to match their historical knowledge. And because they were using printing presses to print all sorts of things, this new spelling became the normal spelling. So basically we spell rhyme and rhythm in a really complicated way because a very small number of probably white English old men decided that they wanted to show off how cool it was that they knew their Latin and change the spelling.
This is not the first time. This isn't the only English word to be affected by the printing press. Some of you might have wondered why a word like ghost that clearly has no H sound anywhere in the word has an H in the spelling, whereas a word like goal or good have no H. Hmm. Back in around 1476, an English merchant brought the first printing press back to the UK from Belgium. With him, to help him work the press, he brought some Flemish workers. Those are people from Belgium. At this time, the spelling of English was shockingly even more flexible than it is today. In fact, we needed the printing press to help us calm down and unify our spelling, although that still took several hundreds of years. So let's go back to ghost. Before the printing press, ghost was still evolving. Sometimes it had four letters, the most original one being gast, G-A-S-T. Sometimes it had five letters. Sometimes it was an A, sometimes it was an O. Like I said, flexible. But the Flemish workers didn't know the English spelling. So whenever they came across a word that sounded similar to Flemish, they kept their spelling. This was given to us in words like ghost, ghoul, and ghastly. But it seems like the English were only interested in keeping the spooky words spelled in this way. So even though other words were spelt like that at the time, they have since changed. Examples of this include goat and girl, which both quickly lost their H. However, of course, it's not so simple. <laughs> we have to remember that English is a language that has been heavily influenced by other cultures. For example, we love Italian food and for hundreds of years it was very common for young aristocratic men to travel around Italy to learn about Italian art and music and architecture. And So when we started eating spaghetti, we had no English word for this very exciting and decidedly not English food. But we did have a habit of having GH in different places in our words. So we kept the word and the food. We didn't feel the need to move it even though it didn't do what every other word did when we put a GH in the middle. Despite our terrible pronunciation, Spaghetti Bolognese <laughs> continues to be one of the UK's favourite foods. We must also note that there is no evidence but a fair amount of circumstantial evidence that suggests that spaghetti was not invented by the Italians but is instead the Italian version of noodles which of course come from China and the wider Asian continent. So yeah, thanks Marco Polo for bringing noodles from Asia to Italy and then from Italy to the UK because we needed it, frankly, our food, we need to help. And now we have both. Now we have all kinds of noodles and spaghetti and everything. <laughs> and one more stolen word, genre. A word used to describe a category, family, or kind of things, such as books or movies or music. And although we do have English words ending in R-E, especially in British English, we rarely pronounce them the way we do with genre. For example, the British English 
theater or center. Are more of an extension of the T like ter rather than pronouncing the R and then the E like genre. This word also started back in Greece with the term genos which talks about the grammatic point of whether something is male, female, or neutral. Whew, thankfully, one good thing, finally. In English, our articles aren't gendered, which makes everybody's life much easier. I think we can agree. <laughs> Perhaps because of this, the word gender in the UK came to mean the gender of a person, which is not how it started out back in Greece. Over time, this separated into two separate words, both from the French, one to define the sexes and one genre to describe categories or groups. And we can see the massive impact of Greek and Latin across the Western world and beyond with these root words like genos used and evolving differently in different places. We find it in both Welsh, genai, to be born, and Old Irish, roginar, I was born. And of course, many words impacted by Latin and Greek also have influences much further away. Remember our first word, rhythm, could be spotted right back in 1066. And I'm guessing your history is a little bit better than mine. <laughs> so you probably know all about the Silk Roads, the transcontinental trade routes across Asia and Europe. Yeah, I didn't learn about those at school. <laughs> it's perhaps not as surprising to you as it might be to many British people to know that we find further roots of these words to describe children in Sanskrit, Zoroastrian languages, German and Armenian. I remember when I first tried to learn French. One of the famous teachers at the time quoted someone as saying that English is just French, badly pronounced. <laughs> the truth is, if you look at most British words deeply enough, you will find it is a truly international language. We have borrowed and shamelessly stolen words from every place we've traveled to. And we can see that we have been heavily influenced from almost every corner of Europe. I'm sorry, but I can't make English writing any easier. <laughs> I hope at least you now understand why there really are no hard and fast rules for the spelling in English. So sorry, thank you for your understanding. <laughs> See you next week. Bye.